So I'm here with uh, Leon Hendricks, uh, the brother of Jimi Hendrix, uh, who was one of the greatest musicians in the history of music. Um, and uh, Leon is also um, an artist, a painter, a musician, and um, so, so uh, the name of your band, or is it the name of the tour, is in the name of Jimmy? Yeah, the name of the tour is in the name of Jimmy. But, you know, I, I'm just a disciple, you know, of one of the many disciples who play guitar because Jimmy was more than a musician. So I'm just like a disciple. So I just carry the spirit. You know, I'm going to uh, Czechoslovakia and Slovakia to meet my new friends I met last year. I'll be coming to Pesnonok, Trincen, Savapotoris, Mikalavos, Olamakak, Kata, and Brino in Czechoslovakia. So I don't know if you guys understood all those names, but I'm coming back. And I, you know, I made a lot of new friends over in Czechoslovakia and Slovakia. And we're like right on the border of Ukraine. And I want to, uh, this is my Save Democracy tour. Um, so it starts in Italy, right? Yeah, it starts in Italy. I'll be in Bergamo on the 27th, on the 28th, La, La Pizia, on the 29th, Mondovia, and on the 30th, Perugia, <laughs> and, and on the 1st, Marotta, Italy, Marotta, Italy. I guess well, <clears throat> yeah, it seems like a great opportunity, and I, I feel like you deserve it. Um, your music uh, is, I actually enjoy listening to it. And I, Have you I heard think, my new album? Um, w w which one is that? If You Need a Friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I listened to, um, I definitely listened to that song, and uh, I think a couple other ones on that one, and yeah, it was good. Well, you know the... Uh, you know who's on that with me? Uh, Ricky Phillips from Sticks, Alan White's on drums, Ian Gillian's doing backup vocals, and uh, Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers produced it. So that's why it sounds so good. Oh, yeah, I really like that song um, The that has the same title as the album. Um, I listened to it. Uh, just on repeat, it has like a really good, you know, flow. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get it back into the studio right now. Uh, after I come back from Italy, I'll be back here in LA and I'm going to do another album. It's going to be called uh, The Ballad of Buster James. You know, we call Buster, you know, Jimmy, his name, his name was Buster when he was a kid. Yeah. You know, so we call it Buster James, The Ballad of Buster James. The kid that played guitar on one string, and a, a lot of people always say, "Well, you can play every mu you can play all the music ever written on one string." I say, "Yes, you can. You can because Jimmy had one string on the ukulele, and he was able to do all that stuff on one string. You know, and you if you check your guitar right now, you can tell that you can play any song on one string." Check it out. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, I guess he's the first song that he learned was the Peter Gunn theme. Yeah, Peter Gunn. Do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, open string, so, down, open string, down, open string, down. And he played it. Uh, the, um, uh, oh, uh, you're also with um, the, the guitarist in your band is Fulvio. Yeah, uh, Fulvio Feliciano. You know, he's half Italian and half Spanish, and he plays guitar so well. He's, you know, he carries the spirit well of Jimmy. But, you know, uh, my goal is to not really do a bunch of Jimmy music. I want to play my own stuff. But when I go on tour, people demand that I play some Jimmy. So we do some Jimmy. We play, you know, the stuff like he wrote for our mother, like Little Wing and uh, Castles Made of Sand. And that was our life story. And, um, you know... Purple Haze, of course, Boxy Lady, but we kind of put a, our own little, you know, mm, technique in it. 
So everything yeah. so all good. You know, it's a Jimmy song, but then in the middle, we do a lot of jazz, fusion, hard rock, metal, whatever, whatever it takes to get the song across. I listened to your last show. There's a YouTube video of Bluesiana last year. Yeah, I, I haven't seen none of none of that stuff. Um, well, you guys did a version of Little Wing where you changed the lyrics, um, and it was actually really good. Well, yeah, because uh, you know, Little Wing is such a short, short song that we kind of do the first verse like twice, and then in the middle, I want to talk about my mama because Jimmy wrote the song about our mother, you know, the little angel on his on his shoulder and stuff, you know, Little Wing, you know. Sometimes lessons come in small packages, you know. So I kind of changed the lyrics up a little bit because when I when I do little wing with these guys in Europe, I feel I feel emotional. So I have to put a little couple of ad libs in there, like uh, I see Mama and Grandma and all my generations. Sometimes you know when you think about the ones that have died and passed on, sometimes the whole room is full. You know, because that you know, we got hundreds of generations of you know of our relatives that came to this spot, and here I am. Jimmy was born, and here I am, and you know I have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. So we're going to uh, continue the legacy, the legacy of the Hendrix family. You know, because we write music. We write music to change the world. Jimmy was the only musician that fifty percent of his music was about peace and love. But nobody understands that. They don't want to mind hear Purple Haze, Foxy Lady, and Hey Joe. But a lot of the stuff is, you know, about peace and love, you know, and uh, trying to get together and stuff. I learned so much from Jimmy as a child. This guy, this guy was, he was more than a musician. That's what I'm trying to say right now. You guys can believe whatever you want, but I'm telling you that Jimmy was actually more than a musician I'm just a disciple to carry that word to testify about him, my brother so so you and uh, Fulvio seem to get along well um, musically it seems like he appreciates what you're doing and you guys have like good um, fr friendship exactly and it's going to even be better when I in two weeks I'll be going back over there and this time we're able to practice for like three days, <laughs> you know, because usually I just have guitar with travel. You know, I just bring my guitar and the bands are already set up over there in Italy. I got a band in England, a band in Germany and a band in Italy. And I just bring my guitar and these guys are so good that that's, that's all I need, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, he actually reminds me of the guitarist John Cipollina from the Quicksilver Messenger Service. Like the uh, his like his look and everything it was pretty cool. Well, you know, uh, you got to understand that he is also trans transcending as I am, and this time on our tour, it's going to be different. You know, I'm able to. To play my own stuff. I'm gonna play my own music off my album, and uh, I'm gonna put a couple of Jimmy Hendrix songs in there. But I actually want to be able to go on tour on my own music one day. Right, right. Um, right now I'm just a messenger and a, and a, and a disciple of Jimmy, you know, like many other guitar players around the world. You know. uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about your music is: Do you? Focus more on trying to make something original, or is it just about um, just enjoying the music that they are trying to make? Listen, okay, here's how it goes. I have all these famous musicians that meet, we meet in the studio, and nobody knows what's going to happen. You know what I'm talking about? So they say, okay, Leon, get on the thing and, and play some play some chord structures for your new song or stuff like that, and and that's what I do. You know, and sometimes I take a whole hour by myself, just laying down tracks and anything I want to play, you know, and then they come in afterwards and start layering it. So I'm happy with that. And I'm making my new album like here in L.A. And like when I get back here for the 4th of July in L.A., got a big uh, music video happening on Ma in Malibu. So I'm going to 
introduce my new album and my new players. My LA band is different than than the European stuff. You know. That made any uh, sense. Yeah, that's that sounds awesome. Um uh, I forgot to say some of my f favorite songs that you've made are Purple Flame, Every Blue September. Oh um, yeah, those are those are Every Blue September. I forgot about that, but it's it's about Jimmy, you know, when he died in September, and uh, and I wrote this song, and I haven't even listened to it for like maybe years. But wow, thanks for bringing that up. Every Blue September, yeah. Yeah, I really like that song. I, I, I was going to ask you, did did you play the, all the guitar on that song? Dude, how many, how many, have you listened to it? You see, there's like many guitar tracks. Oh, okay, okay. I probably did, see, I wrote it, so I probably did the chord structures. You know, and, and then we had these famous guitar players come in there. I think, uh, I don't even know their names because, you know, in them days I was like, you know, wasn't you know? I was like alcoholic, and I was in my limousine out back while they were doing all their stuff. You know, and they came in and, and put these tracks on. And, and Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers, he brought in these these awesome musicians. And every Blue September made everybody cry when we did it in the studio. Yeah, I'm uh, it's that. you know I haven't you know I don't even I think it's E E minor to F sharp or something like that. But thanks for reminding me. I'm going to start playing that on tour because it, it was I, a very emotional, spiritual song for me. I, I, yeah. Ex actually, what I was going to say was that I think you're actually a better guitar player than I am. And I listened to uh, you playing Red House at a in a video on YouTube and um, you were on stage playing it and I, I don't even... Um, As a trio, I, mean, it, I remember it, it actually, it, it sounded good to me because if I were to try to do the same thing, I can't do it. So um, when, when I listen to that, I think it's, it was was a raggedy, you know, my core structures weren't good. But sometimes, you you know, you get the feeling and you play the blues, you know, and whatever comes out, that's that's what it is, you know. And I played right. Red House. I, I remember like last year at a festival, I played with Bad Company. And uh, a couple of other musicians from who knows who. And we did Red House and, and my other guitar player broke the string. So he got off the stage and I was there all by myself as a trio. And I had to do it. <laughs> you know, I got a standing ovation because that was one time when I said, Jimmy, Jimmy, help me with this one. Because my, my other guitar player who, you know, does all the hard work, his, his string broke. So he trying to fix it and stuff like that and it wasn't working and i had to keep playing so I, I did it as a trio and i think i love a trio because in a trio as long as the bass player stays in the root i can actually do anything i want and that's what i learned about jimmy with him and billy cox and buddy miles in other words if they stay in the root jimmy can get throw his guitar on the ground kick it it'd be feeding back an e because you know the whole guitar is e you know if you just let it go by itself it's all e E major. And so he didn't get off stage, you know, go to the bathroom, get a drink, kiss his girlfriend, get back on stage, pick it up. It's still in E because Billy Cox never left the route. And he can play anything he wants to because Buddy Miles and Billy Cox were so solid. They never left the route. You know what I'm talking about? I see, yeah. Um... That's why trios are so cool because you can actually go anywhere you want as long as the bass player never leaves you know <laughs> oh i get it yeah yeah um the uh well, well red house is one of my favorite songs and i uh don't i don't think i'm well yeah you, you know how to play the blues uh is what i'm trying to say yeah i love the blues i in fact i don't i never get a chance to play the blues when i go on tour because, they, you know, everybody wants to hear this hard rock and, you know, rock and roll and metal rock and stuff like that. And I'm trying to do everything. So what I'm going to, I need to get out of that. I need to be able to play my own music and the people like it, you know? Right. I get it. Okay. And that brings me into what I was about to say, which is um, how 
discouraging it could be to even pick up the guitar like even before you pick it up like uh sometimes it's easy to think about all the great stuff that's already been made and then it's like kind of it, it's a, it's an accomplishment sometimes just to just try to do something with it here's the funny thing that happened when i was 12 or something i had my birthday party and, and my dad and buster came over you know jimmy or james we call him buster and they came over and i said daddy daddy i want a guitar like my big brother he goes are you crazy i got an idiot playing guitar and i don't need two idiots playing guitar you know and so i that got in my mind so i never i never played guitar until after i was 50. you know I'm, i write most of my music on the keyboards you know and i don't i don't know why i was stupid enough to try to play guitar but for some reason that's what happened. I write the music on the piano, and then I want to play guitar. And so sometimes I get on stage, and I'm going, fuck, <laughs> what the fuck, you know? I have to go, tell me, Jimmy. He goes, you know, and, and everything comes out good. You know what I'm talking about? Because, you know, anyway. Uh, and so my dad, you know, he didn't like Buster playing guitar, you know? especially left-handed because he thought being left-handed was sinister, you know, and of the devil. So every time Jimmy played, my dad came home, he might've been drinking a little bit and he see Jimmy playing left-handed, boy, he slap him on the head. I told you, boy, don't, don't play left-handed. So that's how Jimmy learned, or Buster learned to turn his guitar upside down when dad came home and he could play backwards, <laughs> you know? And so when my dad came home, Jimmy was playing, you know, right-handed and stuff, and everything was happy. But, but my dad didn't notice the guitar was upside down, you know. And then when my dad leave, he'd, he'd go back left-handed and play it, you know. Yeah, I remember that from from the book. Uh, um, yeah. Do you remember making your other album, Keeper of the Flame? Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I got Buddy Miles on, on a couple of those tracks. You know, I, it's hard to remember the stuff I did because I I want to I want to move on. And, oh and, right, right. You know, what I'm talking about I don't even like my stuff because I'm 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 look I'm not trying to write the symphony of the century. I just want to write a beautiful song. And, and so me and Billy Cox, uh, Juma Sultan, and a couple of other friends from Jimmy's era. We're going to play the Miami Pop Festival on the 27th of May in Miami. And we got all these old, I mean, the spirit's going to be really heavy because these people played with Jimmy, you know, and there are only a few left alive. So we're going to, uh, we're going to do a beautiful thing there. You know, we're going to play. That sounds amazing. Uh, I forgot to ask you, are you planning to have any of your music released on vinyl? You know something? If, the, if you are listening out there, people, I need help. I need management. I don't know how to make merchandise. I don't need, I don't know how to do anything about the business. I just need uh, management to help me coordinate vinyl, you know, because all my friends, they got vinyl out and I'm going, well, well people find me say, yeah, they buy it for like whatever, memorabilia or whatever. And I just need, I just don't have management right now. And so that's what I'm looking for, uh, management. I see. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Or a record label. I might as well put it all in here. You know. Um, like ballad of Buster James. It's going to be so beautiful. The kid to play. Yeah, that, that title actually sounds really good. It is. I got people trying to steal it right now. I said, this is my idea. And they're going, oh, let me write that down. Right? So but anyway, it's not no good unless I do it. Anyway. Um, and so the reason why you started playing guitar was because you, 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 you had a vision, uh, about your guitar, uh, right? Exactly. You want the whole story? Um, yeah. sure. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. Go ahead. This was in the seventies and after Jimmy died and stuff. And, um, my dad had put in my mind that I shouldn't play guitar. So I never picked a guitar up until after I was 50. Right, because that's stuck in my mind all this time. And so I, me I remember I was in my room. I, 
I got divorced. All my kids were grown. Uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. And a vision came to me. My whole room just turned purple. And you could, I had this guitar that I had traded this old lady. She, you know, she didn't have no weed or nothing. And she gave me this old beat up guitar. And I said, okay, cool. And so uh, I stuck it in the corner of my room. It was in that room for like 15 years, not moved out of that corner on this guitar stand. It had so much dust on it, you know, that nobody cared about. But then one night I was just tripping and my whole, like I said, People say, well, Leon, you were imagining. I said, you know, imagination is pretty good. You know, that's mm -hmm. how everything is created nowadays from imagination. So my, so I got this vision and it, it seemed like Jimmy came to me and said, hey, you know, uh, what are you doing with your life? You know, you're, you're sitting up here, you're selling, you know, uh, marijuana to everybody in the neighborhood and you're not doing anything. So. All of a sudden, that guitar started to vibrate. It might be, I think we might have had an earthquake or something, but it was, my whole room was shaking, <laughs> you know? And the guitar was vibrating, and you could see the dust particles pop off the strings, you know? Just like, twang, 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 and I go, whoa! And, and I, got this, I got this thought that Jim was telling me that you need to pick that guitar up and learn how to play it. And so I did. I wiped it off. I had a guy come over and put new strings on it. And he said, damn, Leon, this guitar is all screwed up. You know, I said, well, can you fix it? He said, well, I put some strings on it. And so he taught me a couple of chords. And then I played a couple of chords. I, my first song I ever learned was uh, House of the Rising Sun by uh, Eric Burton and the Animals. You know, there's a house in New Orleans. Those are the first chords I learned. And then come to find out, them chords uh, create all the music that ever been written. Them same chords that I did for the House of the Rising Sun, you can play on any, you can make any song out of that, you know? It's like infinity, you know? It's like infinite music, infinite. You could take some, some time. Uh, I have some questions also about, you know, the spirit of your brother and all those sorts of things, so. Well, you know, music is, in Music is infinite. Carl Sagan said it. Einstein said it. It's infinite. Energy. That means it's immortal. Energy. It's, it's so pure. It's sound and light together. This is what I learned from Jimmy as a kid. You know, he was talking about all of these stories about, you know, uh, how sound actually can heal you. Sound is like, music is like God's language because everybody on the earth when they hear the music they like, they feel it. In other words, music is infinite. And that's where Jimmy dwells right now. And it, his spirit is so strong. He, he has taught me so many things about all the experience he's had over all the lifetimes. He said, I was born, I had I, I have lived before the days of ice. Remember in that song, Access? I have lived before the days of ice and I come back to find the earth all fucked up. Boy, you got better lyrics, but I said all fucked up. You know? And then he says, I come in a spaceship to try to talk to people. Remember? In, in that other song, I just want to talk to you. I won't do you no harm. In other words, Jimmy is alien. He's spiritual. He's everything. And he said in 1983, I'm going to be a merman and live underwater. That's what he said in his song. So what I'm learning is that Jimmy is telling me that there's many lives and many experiences. You know, this, this dwelling that we do on that planet Earth, beautiful Earth, that man has screwed up so much, this is a beautiful place to live. But it's only the beginning of life. And once you get in the circle of life, you, you probably can't even get out of it even if you wanted to. It just keeps going. You know? Just like we live in the wireless world right now, our spirit is wireless, right? But see, we're, dwell we, we're dealing with stuff right now. You're doing wireless shit with me right now through outer space and all these dimensions and you are able to focus on me right now. But there's so many dimensions and worlds out there. Like in the Bible it says, in my father's house are many mansions. Now, how can one house have many mansions? 
what he's saying is that in my universe, there are many dwelling places. And I'll prepare one for you. you know? So our reality is personal with our God. You know? So whatever your reality is, if you believe it, that's what it would be. It also says, whatever you believe, so shall it be. So you have to believe it. You know. Anyway, I'm sorry to start preaching. But... Um, <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, everything... Happy yeah, yeah, happy Easter. Happy, Easter. Happy, happy Passover. Passover. See, all the all these religions were born, we're all cousins, actually. You know, so these three religions, we're cousins. But we're having such conflict because we're not using the music. See, musicians need to write the music <clears throat> to move the people, to change the world. And like they did in the 60s, we stopped the whole war in Vietnam. We marched in the streets, you know to the sound of the musicians that wrote the music, you know? So we're, nobody's writing music. Nashville should be writing some music to have peace over there. You know, Memphis, you know, Tennessee too. You got the blues, you got Chicago, Kansas City, you got Texas, you know, and, and move on over to New Orleans, add a little jazz up to Mississippi, you know, the Memphis and Nashville, put all that shit together. You have a voodoo school, you know, you need to write the music to move the world. I'm sorry. Yeah, That's know, okay. Actually, what you're saying is true. Uh, energy is eternal. And, and it's good timing because I was going to ask you about, I think I saw on Instagram you wrote that that music is the only, um, the only chance for world peace is through music. Yes, it is. Because that's the that's language we all listen to. But but our, our voices and our music has been divided, you know, every country, everything. But if you listen to the rhythm of the earth, they call it earth music and everybody loves it. No matter what country you come from, when you hear that earth music, you're moved by it. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get more into, you know, march, come on, take it to the streets, peace and love, not dead. You know, we just need more participants. Right. Um, so I guess uh, being alive in the 1960s, it was it was a, some sort of feeling of a pro the promise of the future. Well, yeah, because you you got to understand that music is written in eras, eras. You got the classical from the 15, 16, 1700s. You know that was music without electricity, so beautiful that they had to work so hard to make the instruments to resonate. And there was no electricity to use them, but they did it. And we listen to that music now, you know, done over and over again, these great musicians, you know, these great artists, you know. And so then then came uh, Dixieland. You had the, uh, before the hippies, you had the, uh, the beatniks, right? And so what happened is in the 60s, that's when that era of music came, you know, rock and roll was another era. But when the 60s came, it was different and it moved the whole planet. These musicians were so good that they wrote the music to change the world. And that's what we need to do today. We need to write the music to lift the people up to say, hey, let's do this again, you know? Right, I think what you're trying to say is that maybe uh, things have to be reinvented for different generations or it's so. Exactly. so. But, but music will never change. Music will always move the people, but if you're not writing the music for peace and love, you're not writing the music for peace and love. You know, you're writing music about your romance, you lost your girlfriend, and heart throb, and wow, 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 you know, crying about your blues. But you need to write the music to move the people to change the world. Right, there's timeless things about uh, timeless qualities about music, but I guess over time people have to, uh, uh, it's you have to remind people that it has you know importance. Or... Yeah, you just have to write that one song. Say, hey, what's this guy talking about? You know, Jimmy did it a lot of time, but nobody listened to him. You know, uh, like I said, Jimmy was more than a musician. And I'm just one of his disciples. As many guitar players around the world that learned to play from listening to Jimmy said, how did that happen? Who's, who's this guy that makes all this sound with 
with one you know one guitar and one bass player and a drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it actually would be perfect if we start talking about the book that, that you uh, that you wrote in 2012. Okay. Wow. What year is this? Um, well, uh, I, yeah, it was a while ago, but I actually... You know what I'm talking about right now. Oh, it's... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Einstein said, you know, time is only relative to you personally. Yeah. Um, another thing that he said was the most important experience a person can have is the mysterious. So that kind of ties into your some of your experiences with your brother exactly it's what i learned is that your experience with your life you know your biological life here on the planet is all personal with you and your god you know what i'm talking about there's in the whole universe is like a wi-fi and we're like transmitters and receivers so if you can get it into god's wi-fi the universe everything's open up to you especially the music. You know, we're going to write a song that God's going to listen to. And he's going to say, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I really enjoyed reading your book. I think I read it in about three days. And I, um, you, well, you co-authored it with uh, another writer. Right. Uh, uh, but that was, that was only the tip of the iceberg. This, this writer followed me around on tour because I'm a musician. Sometimes I want to play guitar and not listen to him ask me questions, you know? And so the poor guy, he had followed me. I was on tour in Canada. He followed me all around Canada. And finally, he got enough information to, to put it in the book. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. I got another book coming out, you know, whenever I get some time to like sit down. You know, when you write a book, you have to sit down, you know, for weeks at a time with, with somebody and you know get it all out and you have to have the right person to be able to extract that stuff out of you you know out of me you know you just kind of go oh what was your favorite song by jim and i go come on dude ask, you ask me something <laughs> you know relevant <laughs> you know what's my yeah. favorite song come on <laughs> um yeah, that's funny. Actually, I was going to ask you if you were going to write another book, but after I finished reading the one that you wrote in 2012, it it, it kind of, the way that it ended, it made it seem like it was the last book, but so that's why I was like, oh, well, maybe he's not going to write no, anything that was else. The, that was the end of my little story at the time, but I've done moved on and I've done so much stuff, you know, I've done, I've done so much stuff, you know, since then. So that, that book's like not even relevant. because I'm gonna Oh, okay. I see. I get it. Yeah, yeah. And they had to, like, the publisher had to, like, say, okay, that's it. You know, just like when you go to the studio and write music, the, per the producer, the guy that s spent the money, he goes, that's a take. But as a musician, I'm going, no, that was no good. He said, listen, that's done. You know, let's move on. Okay, yeah, I see. Um, well, I think your next book will be probably just as good because the, the first one made me laugh uh some of the some of the things like um it, it really felt like when i was reading it it felt like you were telling the story so um, i was i'm telling the story this is what happened and and there was much more you know there's much more to this little kid jimmy oh we call him right. buster you know buster he was like a michelangelo before he found music he used to draw everything he used to make we had a clay pit in the backyard and the vacant lot he found some clay he started sculpting and stuff because this was the only medium because his creativity was like itching to come out and so then he would draw pictures so beautiful that if you you see some of the pictures he's drawn right like in some of the museums and stuff where he's got his artwork Actually, I read your dad's book uh, after I read My dad your book. Didn't write that and, book. Well, it's the uh, the the well, well uh, actually, I, I have uh, some notes that I took about that. I understand that 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 he didn't. Um, there's a lot, of, you know. Uh, in yeah, my some... my adopted sister tried to, to validate 
you know, her existence. So she had my dad write another book that he probably was never even involved in it because I, I was over there sometimes when the, when the writer was there and uh, the writer didn't even put me in it. And I was, I was right there. I'm the most important person that knows more about Jimmy than anybody in the whole planet. Cause you know, that's how my sister did it. My adopted sister, she like kind of controls the narrative. But now that's different because I write my own music and I'm able to, I got many friends and fans around the world and I'm happy. I'm, I'm just, I'm just a musician, you know, I'm, you know, I'm loving it. Right. Um, actually, the, uh, uh, I agree with you that there were some strange things ab about that book um, that uh, when when you were first mentioned in the book, the, there were there were like all these insults against you, which seemed kind yeah, of strange. Yeah, derogatory stuff. That's my yeah. adopted sister trying to change the narrative. Right, she and at, she don't know nothing. She, you know, I used and, to read her, to read her the Bible, take her to take her to school on the bus and stuff, hold her hand, you know, and then she stabs me in the back like that. I don't care. I'm fine with it. Just leave me alone. Let me write my music because music is my vehicle. So that's all I care about right now. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm, her up no more. But you, right. you were right. It was all derogatory. Stop. And then even even when they, when Jimmy wrote that song about too bad my brother can't be with me here today. It was an apology to me because I was in his room when he had these two blondes. He told the whole story in that song. He said, I sent my brother away because I had these two blondes in bed and I didn't have the time to talk to Leon right then. Right? And then he, he went to Hawaii, New York. We were supposed to meet in New York because Jimmy's contract was up and he wanted to start this new company, you know, Electric Ladyland, you know, right? This beautiful music and stuff like that. So, and then if you hear that song, Jimmy's saying, I'm sorry, brother. But then at the end, Eddie Kramer and my sister st stuck a something on there that says, yeah, come back when you're really black. That, was, that wasn't in the original song. The original song was Jimmy was saying, hey, brother, I'm sorry, you know, but let's get together again, you know. Yeah, um, and the other thing was that even the ending was strange because uh, at the end, uh, um, supposedly your your dad was think was remembering all the important people in his life, and he didn't mention you at, at the end of the book. But I've seen plenty of photos of you and him together, and you guys seem happy. Yeah, you I loved him, happy. and he loved me. He kept me. <clears throat> A couple of my other siblings had, you know, got adopted out, but my dad kept me and Jimmy. My dad kept me and Jimmy, and he he wouldn't let me go away. He kept me all the way to the end until the welfare people came in and, and found me. And that's when Jimmy wrote that song, uh, Castles Made of Sand. I was I was a little Indian boy who, before he was 10, played war games in the woods with his Indian friends. And then one day, you know, I had a dream and, you know, you know the story. That's how right. I started. And the first, the first verse about my mom and dad arguing, I can remember that because me and my, me and Jimmy, we'd be looking out the window. It was raining and mama was had her suitcase and going to the cat and my dad's crying and yelling you know that's the first verse that's when they separated and the second verse is about me the little indian boy who the welfare at at 10 the welfare people found me after my dad tried everything in this possible world to hide us you know and then the last verse is about my mama because the last time we saw mama was in the hospital and she came down the hallway and was kind of dark and gloomy you know that you know uh, public hospitals and she she was all in white and she was in a wheelchair and it seemed like she was floating down the hallway and that's the last time me and jimmy saw her after that she died yeah so jimmy wrote the song about it you know she was in the wheelchair and she, she came to the edge of the shore and she saw things she never saw before and she didn't even have to, but she jumped up out of the wheelchair, it says in the lyric, right? And the ship didn't have to stop because the spirit was just picking up passengers on the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gonna, sometimes I'd be tripping. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, um, yeah, it's yeah. so I, I agree with you about, about your dad's book and I hope I 
talked about it respectfully. I was trying to be respectful. Um, yeah, because you the, can tell my my dad loved me. He he sent my children to college. He, you know, he set a trust fund up for me, worth twenty five million dollars. It was called Bodacious because that was my nickname my dad gave me when I was a kid. And for some reason, that got canceled out of the will from from some kind of uh, a, amendment or something. You know, in other words, my dad didn't know what he was signing. You know, when my my adopted sister, I trusted her at first because she was just a little kid, you know, growing up. And um, so I trusted her until I found out that she's trying to get rid of me. And she's not even a Hendrix. She, she wants to get rid of all the Hendrix. So she can be there. But anyway, uh, God bless you, uh, Janie. You know, I love you. Just leave me alone. Quit suing me. Permission of my brother. Anyway, God bless you. Um, Happy Easter. No, so I was just trying to, uh, I was trying to agree with you that that that, uh, that that your brother's art w w was um, ha had some value to it, and some of it was f featured in your dad's book. That's why I was kind of yeah, bringing some, it up. You know, some of those art pieces in there are mine. Oh, because if you can look, you could tell. I, you know, that Elvis Presley picture that all the songs around it. See, yeah. I do that. You could tell that I did that as a as a kid. And Jimmy's stuff is perfect. I mean, Jimmy's, Jimmy's stuff is good. But if you see that other artwork in there that look, looks like cartoons, stuff like that, that's my stuff. But she, since she took all my dad's stuff out of his house, she put all that stuff together, and now it's, Jimmy drew it. But it's okay, because, you know, I learned a lot from Jimmy. When I was a kid, I used to bug him. He used to play on his little one-string guitar and bug him. So he gave me a pencil, tied a pencil around my wrist. And made me draw pictures. I became a great artist. I was made to live in doing artwork. And plus, because Jimmy tied that pencil on my wrist, I was able to work at Boeing's at the age of 17 because I had won all the draftsman contests, you know. And it was like better than going to college, him tying that little pencil around me, around my wrist. So if I got bored, I, it would be hanging there, so I had to start drawing stuff. You know? Thank you, Jimmy. I was just going to say, it seemed like both you and your brother had natural talents. Like, uh, he, you, both of you were doing art, um, making, you know, uh, different art. And then uh, you're both, I mean, he did music. And the thing is that sometimes brothers can uh, share the same passion. Well, it comes from my mother's side. You know, the mother carries the creative DNA, you know. You know, and uh, because on my mother's side, you know, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but creativity is, you know, there's creators and there's takers, you know, everything that's beautiful in the world was created. And look how beautiful that planet is. It's so beautiful. It's like that. And everything that makes us happy was created by creators. But we have this other problem. We got humans still on the earth. We got humans and human beings. Human beings create, humans take. That's all I got to say about that. And you can figure that out because it's, it's your personal ideology that you have to deal with, your own personal reality. And that's my reality is that creators created everything that makes us feel good on the planet. And then we got these humans that are takers. They become our managers, in fact. I'll just say it that way because they can't yeah. grow nothing, they can't create. But they seem to exploit creativity, and with but without exploitation, our creativity would never be out there. So you got these money people that, that see that oh look at that guy, he, ooh, let's invest in him, you know, and that's how we're exploited. But without exploitation, we can't be out there. So that's that's all I got to say about that. It's all good. Yeah, uh, I, when I, if you don't mind, I'll just say when, when I was reading your first book. Um, I was reminded of the quote from Thule Kupferberg. It says, nobody who lived through the 50s thought the 60s could have existed. Um, do you think maybe uh, that's why your your dad uh, was always kind of like, uh, uh, well, it's from the impression that I got from the book was that he he was so used to, to, to working for himself that when he, he finally... 
uh, ended up taking over uh, all of Jimmy's music, he didn't realize that he could have just retired because Jimmy was so successful. Because let me tell you about the, the attorneys that my dad had and the attorneys Jimmy had. They all took advantage. You know, Jimmy didn't have any money. It was all stolen from him. And then my, when my the lawyers took over, they start stealing from my dad. They give my dad seventy five thousand dollars a year, while they made twenty million a year. And they said, "Well, your dad signed off on this." My dad, listen, my dad was a simple man. He didn't know about all this stuff. And you bring these all these papers for him, and he signed. And getting seventy five thousand dollars a year, he thought that was it. He said, "Whoa, <laughs> you know, tell me because you know we, you know, he was a simple man." But I loved him, and Jimmy loved him. You know, Jimmy bought him a house and two new trucks. And, you know, uh, he gave my dad money. My dad bought me a house. And, you know, we were doing good on $75,000 a year. My dad was giving me half of that for my family. And see, and I kept telling him, I said, Dad, there's millions and millions of dollars out there. What's up? And so he kept yelling at me about, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm, I showed him Billboard. I saw him Rolling Stone. I said, look at Jimmy's music is like selling gold and gold and gold. And they're making millions. And they're only paying you $75,000 a year. And you're giving me half of that. You know, poor dad. He, and then he, when he found out that they were ripping him off, and that's when uh, Paul Allen, you know, the guy from Microsoft, came in and gave my dad $5 million to fight the lawsuit because Paul Allen was like really a Jimi Hendrix fan. You know, he built a museum in Seattle for Jimmy. And then my sister denied him to use it, Jimi Hendrix. So he had to give it back to the city. That, see, that's how ignorant my sister is. She has no vision. Anyway, back to um, who was I talking about before I tracked off? Um, I, I was just going to say that that uh, sometimes times change so, so fast. And that I guess. Oh, exactly. To, to... Okay. I know now. All right. In the, listen, me and, listen, in the 50s, we had no television. We were two little kids. I think he was 10 or I was six and stuff like that. We had no television. But look at the word television. Tele means to transport and vision, put it with it, means to look into the future. And everything, and finally, we finally got a TV. Mrs. McKay, she had the only TV in the whole area in Seattle, in the central area. And it was big as a, it was a big as a, uh, a refrigerator. And the screen was <laughs> yeah. this big. <laughs> and it was green. <coughs> it was green. It was this big. And it was green. And we saw Lawrence Welk for the first time, you know. And it was all static and stuff like that. That was our first introduction to the wireless world, you know, where visions were transported over the airwaves and stuff like that, right? So, in other words, we finally got a television. And we never watched it because, you know, uh, there was only a couple of programs on like Lawrence Welk and Peter Gunn, you know, just simple stuff. And so, so that, that left us, so when the music came in the 60s, it was like a free market. It was like creativity fell down like rain from God, you know, creativity through all in, in England, in America, we had all these fabulous musicians and they were writing a song and these songs actually are still prevalent today. You know, because music is eternal. And that music written in the 60s that moved the planet, it still exists. But new music has to be written. You know, because right now everybody's like, oh, that's a days ago. And they're, they're saying, man, there's so much problems in the world. They need to write the music. That's all it is. It just, you know, write the music to change the, change the planet. You know, we need fresh air and clean water. That's it. You know, we can't even Yeah. You know, they're fighting the wars doing all kind of crap out there. I'm, I'm, that's why I just like to stay in the music world, you know, in the love world. Right. The other thing that I was going to say was that uh, the stories, some of the stories about your father make me laugh. Um, so uh, what you, what you're trying to say? Okay. Give me an example of what you read. Oh, um... For example, uh, he said the left uh, left-handed guitarists like 
Um, yeah, they're evil. Sin right. Sinister. Right. Sin you know, like in Italy, when you want to take a left, you say sinister. Sinistra. That means go oh. left. Destra means go right. So my dad thought that if you were left-handed, you're of the devil. And my dad <laughs> had six fingers on his hand. So I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> you know? But so he didn't like left-handed players for some reason. He just had this this thing that, you know, made him upset. So Jimmy had to learn to play the guitar right-handed and left-handed. Because he wanted to play left-handed. My dad didn't want it. So he turned the guitar upside down and played backwards. So you had to be like really ambidextrous. Or there might be something else. <laughs> but how do you do that? How do you flip a guitar upside down and still play better than every guitar player in town? You know? Yeah, I love it. Um, one of the similarities that I that I found was uh, when I was reading the book uh, between you and your brother is um, kind of well. well for, there, there's this book that that, that came out um, by Richard Wright. It's not, it's not a book. It's a short story that he wrote called "The Rite of Passage," and it's about this. Uh, uh, boy, his name is Johnny, and uh, he ends up having to leave home because he realizes that uh, his, uh, his name isn't real. And uh, so, um, you talking about Johnny? He, right, right. Like uh, he, he had his. It, well, your brother had his name changed, and then uh, I was remembering that the, the time in the book when your your dad went to Berkeley to go get him, and then. It, it it like the two like the thing in the book and the thing in uh, the the story. I don't know if you've heard of Richard Wright. He's a uh, African American writer. No, but I can tell you exactly what happened. Uh, my dad was in the army. My dad left to go to war. Married my mom. You know, and she had this. My dad didn't come home for five years. He was gone for five years. Okay, so. Uh, so little Johnny, he was named Johnny Allen, and that's the name of my mama's boyfriend at the time, because since my dad didn't come home for five years, my mom went moved on with her life, you know, and and uh, her boyfriend was named Johnny, you know, Johnny Brown, you know, and so they named him little Johnny. So little Johnny, for five years, been called Johnny, and so when my dad came home, my dad would, my dad would go, hey. You know, I'm gonna change your name to James. And so he would never answer to James. My dad would say, James, come here. You know, little Buster, I mean, little Johnny. He would, he, because he was Johnny. So he didn't know what my dad was talking about, right? And so he was so confused that he had to make his own name up. He said, I'm call, call me Buster. My name is Buster. You know, because we saw the uh, Buster Crab movie, you know, Flash Gordon and stuff like that. For nickel every Saturday for 15 minutes, and he wanted to be like Buster Crab, so he said that's a good name for me, Buster. So that's what everybody called him. So my dad even had to call him Buster. My dad had couldn't call him James no more, or Johnny. So we all called him Buster. That was his childhood name. You know, and right. he made it up. You know, poor kid. He had, you know, come on. He said, I thought my name was Johnny. You know, <laughs> I've been bopping and rocking and rolling and Johnny. And then you want to change my name to James? Come on. So I'm writing a ballad oh. called, I, I'm writing this ballad called the, uh, the Ballad of Buster James, you know, who, who, play, who learned to play guitar on one string. You know, that's right. What, that's what and it might seem confusing to some people, but it's actually normal for, um, for brothers to have nicknames for each other. Exactly. He called me Lon. I've, you know, sometimes they call me Lee, and sometimes they call me Lon, you know, but we all called him Buster. We never called him Johnny or James. It was all, it was always Buster, you know. That's how I, when I grew up, I thought his name was Buster, you know, all these years, you know, because that was his name he chose for himself. Oh, um, something that, that, that really fascinated me when I was reading your book was, uh, you, it was interesting how you mentioned in your book that you never saw your brother reading uh, books very much, but that he naturally had s so much knowledge that he possessed. Exactly. I've never seen him read a book. I've, I've been with Jimmy for years, you know. He used to babysit me. 
he never read a book or anything, but he seemed to have this knowledge about the planets and the stars and the constellations, you know, like when, like when he said, I live before the days of bias and I come back to find the stars misplaced. Well, see, he would know that scientists didn't know that, you know, the stars were misplaced after this, after the little ice age. Am I not correct? Scientists have proven that right now. But Jimmy seemed to know this stuff, you know. It was awesome. Yeah. Talk about yeah. aliens, you know. We saw, it, we were together and we saw two flying saucers, plane, you know. Me and him were playing in the woods and stuff, you know. And like my first instance with a flying, with a fly, alien flying craft, was when you remember Transformers when they came out in in the early seventies, you know. The Transformer kids, you know, the little toys for kids. You know, that yeah. you used to yeah. flip and change into different stuff. This is what yeah. I saw, you know, crash in our yard. It was, it was, and this was in the 50s, okay? So Transformers weren't even made, but it was a machine and it had an eye and everything. And it started flipping it, then it took off again, you know? Jimmy said, look at Jimmy said, you know, in other words, when Jimmy was seeing flying saucers, they were like normal stuff. Like we didn't even get excited anymore. We, because we told our dad one day that we said, look at dad, come out, come out. He said, you guys, you guys' imagination has gone too far. <laughs> I don't want to hear that shit no more. But we said, dad, dad, look, look. He said, ah, you guys are crazy. And so, you know, even when we were growing up in, you know, in Seattle, Jimmy would talk about stuff so all the mothers wouldn't allow all the kids in the neighborhood to play with us no more. Because they said, stay with them Hendrix boys. <laughs> because Jimmy was always talking this, you know, this outer space stuff. Right? And so we yeah. couldn't play with the kids. So they forbid us to play with the kids. But the kids would sneak over and, you know, and sneak under the basement and come upstairs because my dad had these six fingers on his hand. So when he was drunk and laying out on the couch, we bring the kids over and they we go, ah! we put my dad's hand up and go like, Whoa! and the kids would run home and tell their mamas and stuff. And so we were not allowed, you know, we were like shunned <laughs> after that. It was like all over. Yeah, I, I do remember that part in the book where you found that um, it was like a piece of metal that came down from the sky and then you found it in the. It um, crashed. I get, I, I, in my book, I, in my memory, I thought it hit a bird. But it probably hit a branch and all the leaves just like this and it was flipping on the ground and it was transforming like just like they did in the 70s when they make those toys yeah. and it was a, like a camera and so it was like a probe a probe from outer space you know checking us out and they were checking jimmy out a lot because jimmy they they were able to guide him and to, for him to write this beautiful music about peace and love and stuff like that so it was all good you know they were spying on us Look at the moon right now. Listen, why does the moon not rotate like all the other planets in the universe? They define, defy cosmic winds. And so what I'm saying is that who's looking at you? You know, we got an eye in the sky looking at, you know, been here all these years, you know, watching over us. You know, we got benevolent uh, aliens out there that want to help us. And we got the other side. There's benevolent and the other word is malevolent. You know what I'm talking about. Malevolent, yeah. They've been fighting over this planet for 50,000 years. They're finding cities in South America now that are 2,000 years before Moses. So they're finding this shit right now that the earth has been the home of many races and many, you know, many life forms right here on this planet. And it's the same thing in heaven. Like he said, as it is in heaven on earth, as it is in heaven. We're having conflict in heaven just like on earth. Because they say we're having, we're having bullshit happen out here too. They've been fighting over this planet for 50,000 years. And they don't want it destroyed because they've been coming here for so long and moving on. You know, that they're not going to let nothing happen to this planet. You know. Anyway, that's, that's another story. Um, yeah, we'll get back to that uh, soon because I have a lot of questions about all, all of those things too.